Okay, any questions back here? Uh, thinking about it, but not for me to yes, right? Uh, what you are saying is true for half the climate, <laughs> not true for the other half. And uh, so maybe there is uh, an unfairness uh, in asking the whole class to go through that. But I, I would rather err on the side of making sure that everybody is following up to a certain level than well, it's going to be for those who did well in the second midterm and done the assignment version of it by yourself, it should be a very easy quiz. Okay? Um, so I don't think you will be penalized for just taking that quiz. But I'm hoping that the others will prepare for it, study for it, and uh, get up to that point. So I haven't made up that quiz yet. But the structure of it is in my mind, so on the weekend I don't miss that. So this is just a reminder that on Monday there will be a quiz focusing on the second term aspect of that. And that's slightly different problem, but the mechanics of going through this will be very similar to what you've done. So it would be a good idea for everyone to uh, do the assignment part carefully. Yeah, in terms of the weight, that's what I'm thinking. I will uh, add that to the homework weight. Because that's the only one that gets kind of left undefined, similar rate assignment by side. So I will adjust that in such a way that the quiz is pointed towards that. So your midterm one and two will be 2020, the final will be 40. So this will be part of the quiz. Uh, yeah. I'm treating all the homeworks with equal weight, and so this will be. So if we end up having nine homeworks, it will be 20 over nine. Okay. So it's not a heavy, heavy toll. It's just for. Every, I just wanted everybody to go through the. Well, I will time it in such a way that it's not uh, going to constrain your trivial. Now the purpose is to make sure that all of you can go through all the steps, so you should have enough time to go through all the steps. Okay, so any other questions or comments? We are almost at the tail end of the course. There are a few topics now focus on the control issue. So I still in the next two lectures what I want to do is you will find that I did not put a lot of notes there. I want to solve the problem in class with you so that I control the pace and you understand how all the things come together. So this problem that I'm going to do today is uh, proportional integral uh, control action. And we will do it by signaling, by MATLAB, and uh, by hand. I'm excellent. I don't want to take a lot of time doing manipulations by hand. But um, I will take you through all the steps and you need to substitute the numbers and complete the part. And the next problem that I have put on the notes is one where it's a more complicated process involving three tanks and the heater is in the first tank and the sensor is in the third tank. So how does that affect the dynamic process? How do we build the transfer function? So we'll go through whatever we have seen in this course from right from the stage one. Building the model, process model, linearizing the model, and uh, building the transfer function, building the block putting the, the feedback controller, and then looking at the performance of the feedback controller. So this might take us two or three lectures, but I think this is going to be the kind of thing that I will be focusing on in the final exam. So it's important to uh, go through all the steps uh, at the pace that all of you are comfortable with. So we're still talking about the same heated tank problem. 
Okay, because it has a simple type of structure. But now we are going to look at proportional integral action, which we started setting up the problem in the last class. And the goal is to do a disturbance projection type of a problem, meaning find the relationship between the outlet temperature of the process and a disturbance which is coming in the inlet seat temperature. So the inlet seat temperature goes up by five. What control action should I take here? So that I bring it back to the original set point. So the set point doesn't change. The set point is here. It doesn't change. So it can, the change in CI is considered a disturbance, which we should uh, uh, get rid of. Okay. So the first task is, of course, to find the effective transfer function between C prime and C I prime. And uh, the in the forward path, we have simply one over tau s plus one. And in the Denominator, you have the entire thing in the loop. So it is 1 plus GC times A times 1 over tau S plus 1. So this is the essence. Okay? So this is the relationship between the output process temperature and the inlet load change in the inlet temperature. So you do the algebraic manipulation and simplify it. We can write it. And the important thing to notice is when I, when I had only a proportional controller, only KC, I ended up with a first order process. Now when I add a proportional and an integral action, I end up with an effectively a second order process because I have S square there. Okay. Now all these numbers are known. You tune tau i, the integral constant, in the controller, and you tune kc, the proportional constant in the controller. So these are the two constants that as a control engineer we choose. Okay. And tau is the process time constant that is given to you. And similarly, uh, case uh, A would be the process gain in the heater, how much just the heater, the heater inputting for uh, unit change in the error signal. Okay. So other numbers are given in the problem. We will do a numerical problem, but the first step I, I, we did in the last class is to get this effective transfer function. And I showed you that you can do this by hand, which is this step, or you can do it in MATLAB using the symbolic toolbox. Okay. And the piece of code is given here that will achieve the same thing. So you define the process transfer function, just the process, 1 over tau s plus 1, the control, controller transfer function, which is the proportional and integral part. You see the integral part here. And so the effective transfer function is simply GP divided by the <coughs> equal GP GCA. And symbolic processor will take care of all the multiplication and simplification for you. Okay. And simplify that, and you get exactly the same expression, analytical expression that we did by hand. Okay. So tau i s divided by tau i times uh, s square tau. So the order is shifted, but it's essentially the same expression. Now, in the next part, and all I'm doing is rearranging it in the standard second order form, where we have this uh, degree of uh, over damp, under damp that we determine with beta, and we have an effective time constant for a second order process. Okay. And uh, so th those things can, things can be simply obtained because they're all related to the known constant, the process time constant, and Kc and tau i. So those are given to you. I want you to go through the uh, algebra to get at that. Now, I want to force a specific problem and start doing it by hand. Okay. So we will come back and use that effective transfer function when we do it by hand. So the problem is the following. Determine the response of a closed loop system in a heated tank uh, using proportional integral action. Okay for the following cases. So KC, you are asked to consider 5, 10, 20, and 100. Proportional gain, four different values. But now we are focusing on trying to understand how does the controller affect the response, and what is a good response, and what is a bad response. So we've picked four values for K KC, keeping tau i, the integral action, to be a constant in the first case. And we're given the process and constant and the gain for the heater which is A. Okay. Do this by Simulink, by MATLAB, and by hand. Okay. And the second part of it is repeat this using a constant value for KC. 
Now fix the proportional gain to be 20, but change the integral constant over a range of values 1, 2, 5, and 10. Okay. Remember, which is the stronger proportional action, 5 or 100? 100 would be the stronger action because the, the input error signal is multiplied by KC. Okay. So the output signal will be much larger when KC is larger than smaller. How about how I? It is written as KC 1 plus 1 over tau i f. So if tau i is larger, the integral action is, magnitude of integral action is smaller. Okay, if tau i is smaller, the integral action is larger. So this is going to result in a bigger integral impact on the controller, uh, on the process uh, from the controller. Okay? So any questions on the problem statement? Yeah. The integral action itself, like if you want to look at the effective integral action, this should be written broken up as K, Kc plus Kc divided by tau i x. So this would be your effective uh, integral action that controls the integral action. Okay. Uh, but since Kc is a common factor, as long as you fix Kc and change only tau i, the smaller tau i means the larger integral action. Okay. Yeah, right. Typically, this is how it's just a convention. This is how it is written. Kc is factored out, and tau i is called the integral time constant. Okay. So let's do it by simulink first, and then by MATLAB. And uh, finally, uh, by hand. Okay. So for Simulink, I need to understand what the blocks that I need are. So maybe you can help me here. Okay. So here I have GP, which is 1 over 5S plus 1. And what comes out is the temperature T prime. Okay. And I'm sampling this. There is no measurement delay. And here I have TR prime uh, plus minus. It's a negative feedback, okay? And I have GC here, and I have uh, A, the heater. Okay? And I have TI prime, so I actually have plus plus. I need to, this is my block diagram. I need to capture every one of them in the simulator, okay? So this is TI prime. So I need to put all this into Simulink. And what am I interested in? I'm interested in predicting T prime, the response of the process to various changes in KC and tau i. You want me to go through the building block or can I just throw the diagram? I have people's diagram, but if some of you feel that I need to do that, I'm Anybody? No? Okay. Then I will save myself some time and open the simulation model. Okay. Can you see that? Does that make sense? Take a minute to understand whether we have put in everything that we talked about. Okay. So here you have a PID controller. When I click on that, I have KC and KC over tau i. Um, and this is the gain, which is 1 over 14 for the heater. Okay. And this is the process time for function. And this is the step change for TI prime. Okay. Now, do I need the step change? No. Can I get rid of it? And get rid of this. Get rid of that. I'm leaving you down a pan. Can I do this? Uh, 
I don't have a set point, right? But I'm not making a change in the set point. Set point TR is zero. In this particular case, I'm exciting only TI. So it should be okay. And I'm taking you down the wrong path. I want to see how many of you catch a problem. Yeah. Why, why is it not? Right? But the error is the difference between the set point and what comes back, right? So the set point is zero, so the error is basically what comes back. Or is it? Well, okay, so if I put here zero, okay, so there's a signal that is coming there which is zero. Okay, so the signal that is coming through this is zero, and there is some signal that is coming through this. So it's the difference that is going into the controller. Okay, now if this is zero, does it make a difference? Negative one, that is important, okay, because this is a negative feedback control system. A positive feedback control system will make that impossible. So let me just show you what happens. If I did, if I did make that mistake and say I don't want this, I don't want this. And I connect this to this. So the measurement is going back as an error, but because it was a negative feedback, the error would have been negative. So if I did this simulation, and oh, I have an error. Now what is this error due to? Let's see whether you can error. Uh, let me run this again so that you can read and learn to decipher what the error is. Can you read that? I didn't define KC and some I. So I need to go to the MATLAB session and put KC equals over the number I5. and sub I equals, I don't know. So now they are defined, so it should run and give me a result and the result is and it is very good. That's what I wanted you to observe. See? If I have a positive feedback, then I get an unstable response to the system. Okay? Now if you don't believe that this is unstable, just do the integration for five hundred. Okay. And you'll find that it keeps on blowing up. Ten to the twenty nine. Temperature is going to ten to the twenty nine. Okay. So that is a positive feedback control system. What it says is if the temperature goes up, I put more heat. The temperature goes up, I put more heat. Okay? So I just keep on heating it up. Okay? So it is important to have a negative feedback. And so how can you achieve that? You can achieve that by, by this process, which makes the negative sign here, makes it as a negative one. Or you can put a gain block with a negative sign, which will put that sign. Either one would work. So now, if I do the simulation, does this make sense? It makes sense. Okay. Is it a good controller? Now we want to do it for a whole range of KC and tau i to understand what is a good controller and what is a good bad controller. Right. Oh, uh, how did they know it was positive before? Because whatever signal that is coming in through this, okay, if some number 5 is coming through this, which is 0, so what is going to go out to where is 0 minus 5? Okay, so this is that's where the looking for the signal occurs. Whereas without it, if I take the signal and put it back, it's going to go back as 5. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So the zero is very, I don't uh, need this, for example, it would still work, okay, because now I'm flipping the sign through that summation block. Okay. 
Uh, so now I need to do the whole range of cases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a script. And uh, again, I have done the script. Okay, so can you read that? Take a moment to study that and make sure that you understand what I'm trying to do. This is a script that we have used before. So we have asked to do four simulations for four different values of Kc, 5, 10, 20, and 100, just to understand which is a better uh, controller, which parameter is a better parameter. And then tau i in this case is fixed at 2. So I'm setting up a loop here that says do it for as many times as there are numbers in the vector z. Okay. So vector z is the one that contains all the possible case values. And then the first thing that I do is pick up each time I pick up one value from z c. So when i is equal to 1, z1 will be kc. Remember, kc is to be defined in the workspace for it to be picked up by simulink. Okay. And similarly, tau i has to be defined in the workspace. So this script defines those variables in the workspace. And then the sim command makes a call to the simulink. So I should have stored that simulink simulation into a file by name ex27 underscore sim. Okay, you see the name there. Okay. So okay. So I'm making a call and say do an integration up to 50. And send the output, and the output is time. Simulation always has a time as an independent variable. X is the state variable. We don't worry about it yet. And Y is the output variable from the simulink. Okay. So what are the outputs that I'm getting from the simulink here? I guess I wanted to ask you, so I'll delete it. So I have only one output coming from there. And that output is the output temperature. Um, so y is going to be a one column vector and then I'm plotting uh, t versus y. Okay, so let me just run the simulation. If I run the simulation, what would you expect? Yeah. Four different graphs on the same graph sheet. And they will all be for different values of the only problem is you don't know which one is for which KC. Can you take a guess? Very good. Okay. That is, remember, we already talked about what is the magnitude. If the KC magnitude is larger, its impact on the process is much higher. So it tries to bring it back to the steady state much quicker. quicker okay? And the integral action is to get rid of the offset and bring it back to zero. Okay? So the disturbance rejection is the best when you have Kc equal to 100 in the four cases that we have studied. Okay? Uh, there are problems in other processes. In this particular case, you can ask the question, if I put Kc equal to 1,000, does it get better? And the answer happens to be, yes, it does. So we can try 1,000 there. Yeah, simulation you will find that it is much better. Okay? But in some processes, it may make, make the system unstable. Okay? So we need to talk about stability later on. But in this case, it remains stable because the simple subtract of process and the effective transfer function is only second order. Now, you notice something about the nature of the response. Can a first order process have that kind of a response? No, it has to be always exponentially decaying or growing. Okay? So because this effective transfer function is second order, you will have this oscillation. When you do it analytically in the third part by hand, you will notice. What should you notice in analytical expression? You should notice sine of cosine in your analytical expression. That gives you this oscillation. And the strong exponential decay. Okay, so the exponent, the e, e to the power of something, a negative something should be a large number so that it decays it very quickly. Okay? So any questions on this? So this is what I mean by doing by simulink, meaning build a block and then drive the simulink using the script for doing a parametric study. Because as a control engineer, your job is to find, come up with the best set of control parameters, Kc and tau i and tau d in the case of the derivative one. Okay. 
So this gives you an option of exploring that very, very effectively. Now, this is not part of the question and the problem, but I'm going to ask you a question. Suppose I ask you to track and predict how does the heating, one of the questions is, we saw, for example, when we went from 100 to 1,000, the response was almost immediate, right? Very quick. Now, do you expect that in reality? What, what would happen in reality? Here, what have you assumed about the heaters, the gain for the heaters? Okay. Instantaneous response. So if there is an error, it's going to immediately pump certain amount of heat without any delay. Okay? Is that realistic? That's not realistic. So in that sense, k c equals 1000, what it gave us is not a realistic response. So you need to realize that the problem is because of this. So you need to come back and understand what is the heater that you have. Is it an electrical heater? Is it a steam heater? And what is the dynamic process? And build that into that. Okay? That will give you a more realistic response. Now, if I ask you the question, what is the heat output? How does that change with time? How would you get that? I guess I should not have that. And I'm going to ask you the same thing in uh, my hand. That, that you need to think about. Do you understand my question? My question is, if I make a step change to Ti by 5, okay, I can now plot out and monitor how the output temperature changes from the process. We plotted that out already. At the same time, I would like to know or put a tap into a heater that draws the current, for example. Okay. How does the current draw or how does the heat output change with time? Is the controller going to keep the heat output constant or is it going to change with time? It's going to change with time. Right? So how do I sample that? How do I get that graph of Q versus time? The heat output versus time. Okay. In single link, if that piece of cake, all you need to do is copy of that okay, and connect that to where? To this point. That's where the heat output is coming. So that line is carrying the signal of uh, so many joules uh, uh, heat output. Okay? So run the simulation. Oh, I guess I shouldn't have done that. I should have done. Cool. What would be the difference between connecting to a scope and connecting it out? It gives you, it puts it into the second column of Y. Okay. So, what am I doing? I did something wrong. Oh, I'm still a thousand bytes. Um, Now, the integration I've done on 500, that's why you see that. That's the response for KC equals 5, that's how I put it too. That's the output response. So if you look at this plot, this tells you what happened to the heating. Does it make sense? This is what you would expect. The inlet temperature went up by 5. If you didn't do anything to the heater, the outlet temperature would have gone up by 5. But you needed to bring it back. Okay? So what you have to do is decrease the heat input to the tank. Do you have a question? Or no? Q, the heat output. That changes in temperature, right? Right, okay. I'm not adding Q, it's negative here. Watch that. Okay, so it is decreasing Q. It is decreasing Q from 0 to minus 1, minus 1, minus 2. That's right. Right? 
But initially, it was adding at a high rate, so the slope is high initially. The slope of dq dt is high initially. Okay. But once it reaches the steady state, what is the slope of dq dt here? Zero. So this is the final q. It happens that it, it, by calculation of units, it, is, it also has the same numerical value of 5. But if you look at the units, this should be 5 watts or kilowatts or whatever. Okay. So in such a way that the decrease in heat causes the temperature to go down by 5, the outer temperature. Uh, yeah, here. Remember, well, they, they should have the same unit. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, you're right. That's fine. Yeah, I'm adding a temperature 5, so this should have the same unit as 5. So that, that's why it's 5 degrees, right? So I should have sampled it, I guess. No, but if I sample it here, right, if I sample it here, I get the error. If I sample it here, I get the controller output. And the controller output would be in terms of watt per degree. And that gets multiplied by K, which gives you so many watts. I think I need to replay it because I missed it. The card is, I need to explain this more carefully. Okay. All right. The, the lo his logic. I just want to make sure that everybody is following that. Is this what I'm plotting in scope two? I claimed initially that it is watt, but it is not. It is actually temperature. Okay. And that is why that I know that simply because I'm adding in the circle these two. The signal that is coming from the step change, which has a unit of degree c. And so this must also have the unit of degree C. I can add only two signals without the same unit. Okay. So the effect of uh, an error going back is that the controller puts out a certain amount of heat. Okay. And uh, the controller gain converts that into an equivalent temperature. And that's what I'm plotting. So when the temperature here goes up by 5, the temperature comes down by 5. Canceling is that like giving you what the final uh, output temperature is. So let me delete that. And let's just put this. Okay. Now the question that I have to ask you is what would be the units for this line that I'm tapping now? How would I know that? I would know that by simply going back to look at looking at what A is. A is one over WC. Okay. So, um, what is W? W is the flow rate, right? This is the heat capacity. So, so many joules per kg degree C. And so, this would be kg per second. Okay. So, this should be joules per second per degree C, which is watts per degree C. Right? For WC. So one, 1 over WC would be degree C per watt. Okay? So this block basically takes watt and produces degree C as the output. Thank you for picking this point. It's an important one. Does everybody understand that? Okay? So if I sample it here, I will get the units in terms of watts. How much of watt that the controller is saying that the meter should. Uh, Output. Okay. So now I am doing. So those are the units in terms of watts for the heater. Duty goes down because the temperature has gone up. The inlet temperature has gone up. We need to add less amount of heat to keep the outlet temperature constant. Okay. And so from this one, you can actually read what would be the net decrease, 70 watts, for example, at steady state. Let me give the auto temperature to the Any questions? So the nice thing about Simulink is that you could get answers to any questions like this. What is the heat of duty? How is it changing this time? By simply tapping at the right signal and 
routing it to the either the output or the code. Okay. If we have to do this by hand, what would we do? When we're talking about it, let's discuss that before I go to the next part, which is the next slide. Here is a graph, and I ask you to develop by hand uh, Q of T or Q of S divided, oh, sorry. Prime divided by I want to get an effective transfer function. If you have that transfer function, then it was just a matter of uh, finding out what Q is from that. Okay. Uh, hold on, that's not what I want. I want to answer the same question of how does the output Q change to a change in inlet temperature T i? So forget this too. <laughs> what would I get? What what should I get to answer that question of I want to plot yeah Q over T I that's what I wanted. I'm really not very alert today. Q I Q over T I <laughs> Q over T I. That's what I want. How do I get that? Help me out doing that because I'm terrible today. <laughs> Right. So let me put Q here. Okay. <coughs> That's where I sampled, right? I sampled Q there. So I want to uh, relate that. Uh, I mean, I'm sampling it this way, taking the signal out. Ti is the one that is coming in. So how would I write an effective transfer function between Q and Ti? This is an application of what you have seen before, but I want to make sure that you understand that to apply in a totally new situation. You see? Okay. Everybody agree with that? Remember, the rule is between the inlet and the outlet, you want to go in the forward path. Okay? So it is not A, the forward path is the signal is um, like it's coming here, TI prime, and it is going via GP and GC, and it comes out. So the forward path includes this way and this way. So if there were a process, uh, a measurement, uh, it would include that in the forward path. Okay, so the effective transfer function in this case would be GC times GP divided by one plus everything in the loop. Again, if you don't follow this rule, write down all the algebraic expressions. Many of you did that in the exam. Start eliminating and get the effective transfer function. Once you have that, then it's very easy because Q is simply pi over S times the GC GP divided by one plus. And I, I know all of them. Okay. I can do either plus on that to get the output. Okay. This kind of generalization you should be able to do. Okay. Uh, in an exam, as I said in the past, so there are one or two sub questions like this where I'm not specifically covered what to do, but uh, extending what you've seen, you should be able to answer questions like that. How does the measurement signal change with time? How does the error signal change with time? Or does the controller signal change with time? Things like that. Any questions? Okay, so that part is uh, the first section uh, dealing with by simulink. Okay, so we, we saw how the simulink block looks and how it can generate a whole class of results to understand. Uh, I guess we, we also have to do uh, tau i. How would I do that? For different values of tau i. That is important for you to do so that you understand the effect of tau i, the effect of kc. We saw that increasing kc gives you better control action. Is the same thing true with tau i? Okay. Uh, to answer that, I'm going to take the script that I have and ask you to change it for me. What would I change here? In this case, I'm fixing kc at 20. And tau i takes the value of 1, 2, 5, and 10. How could you change here? 
I give you the script and say go and change it, what would you do? And change KC and top. So make this as KC equals 20. Okay. And make this as so it's going to go through four times, but this time it's going to pick from the vector Z the values of tau i. Okay? And tau i is put in the workspace and the simulink, the same simulink model will pick that up. Correct values of tau i. Any questions on that? So what is the response for? What are the parameters in this case? Kc equals 20 and tau i equals 1. Okay. Now run this through. Second time. Okay. Now third time. Which is better? Uh, I guess you need to watch which curve is being added, right? <laughs> I need to probably show you more. Okay, the largest one that we have is 1.5 or something like that. Now you get the sense, okay? So starting with this is for the lowest value of tau i, and as we increase tau i, the response deviates from the set point. Uh, much more widely and it takes longer. So what does this tell you? Having a lower tau i is better, which is what we saw earlier intuitively because tau i appears in the denominator, the lower value of tau i means the impact of the controller is larger, more significant. So it tries to bring it back to, but what is the problem in having a lower pi? It oscillates more. Okay. So that's the compromise that you need to make. So control of tuning basically means achieving this compromise. You want to get the quickest response, but you don't want the process to oscillate. Okay. Ideally, you would like to have a uh, monotonic um, decrease from perturbation. Any questions on that? Okay. The second part of the question is do this by MATLAB and the third part by hand. Now, when I say MATLAB, you have to assume that you don't have similar toolbox. Okay. What would that entail? Write a script. Right? So what are the things that come to your mind? I have a script written. I will remind me if I forget, I will upload all these script files uh, into this lecture on uh, more. Now I'm not using that as simulink at all, but I'm using symbolic toolbox. Okay, symbolic toolbox to get a symbolic expression for the response, the output response. So I'm defining a whole set of symbols: tau, tau i, a, k, c, g, c for the controller, g, p for the process, and s where the plot variable is the time. So in line three, what I'm doing is I'm defining this process transfer function symbolically. So tau is now a symbol, okay? And in line four, I'm describing the controller transfer function that includes both proportional and integral parts. Again, symbolically, tau i is a symbol, not a number yet. And the effective transfer function. So this is where that rule of calculating the effective transfer function is useful. Symbolic uh, so simulants really don't care about it, okay? So when you're doing it in MATLAB, it is nice to have this effective transfer function rule so that you can write this as a forward divided by one plus the entire loop. Okay? So that is the effective transfer function. Then I say simplify that. Okay? And then I'm going to substitute numerical values. So I'm defining all the values. Z I want for a whole set of four numbers. Tau I is two, tau is five, A is one over fourteen. Okay? So I'm setting the loop for four times. And the first time I'm picking K C uh, from the vector Z. And what am I doing here?
line 11. Substituting the values for the symbols, that's one thing that I'm doing. I'm doing many things there. I'm doing a step change. That's the important thing I want you to notice. Okay? Uh, so the 5 here comes from the fact that it is a 5 degree step change. And for a step change, the transfer function is 1 over s. So this is, at this stage, this is the effective transfer function, the ratio of output to input. But here, it is only the output. So they are multiplied by the input, which is a step change of 5 over s. A step change, okay? And then this is trivial. I'm just uh, converting it to the four decimal place of precision. And this is important. So this is where, when you're doing by hand, you're going to do all these steps by hand, which are not very difficult to do. But this particular step is going to be the difficult one to do because we need to invert it. That means do the partial fraction. Okay, so we're going to do the partial fractions and do the inverse. So this particular part is the place some of you spent a lot of time and lost time in the exam. So this will be there in the final exam too. So watch your time. If you get that part, just leave it, go and do the other parts and then come back and finish it if you have time. Okay? But in math lab it's just one line, just the inverse. And then easy plot, basically plot. Okay? That's what I mean by saying do it by math lab. So by using any of the single link uh, plots, that you are plotting okay. so the easy plot takes a symbolic expression and plots it holding the plot so it just keeps on adding to the previous plot Okay. So this is the graph that is added. Previous one was changing tau i. Okay. Onto that I'm adding one more. And then now run through this loop several times. Four times. And there you get all the previous four graphs. That's a good four graphs. I should have cleared it up. Um, okay. It's going to run through four times and then produce a graph for you. These are the same graphs that we did in Simulink. Okay. It should be the same. We should compare that. Any questions on the script? In industry, when you go and work, these are the tools that you will use and you will find helpful. Simulink and MATLAB. Okay. So how are we going to do it by hand? But in an exam, doing it by hand is important. Okay. So in this case, doing it by hand, what does it mean? It simply means I'm going to go to this expression that I have. Go to this is the effective transfer function between the output and the input. So I get all the numbers that I have given. Tau i is 2, kc is 5, a is 1 over 14. So you'll get a numerical uh, numerator and denominator. Okay? And then multiply this by 5 over s. You'll get a quadratic equation in the denominator. Do factorization, do partial fraction, and that much you should be able to do in the next uh, final exam. Okay. For that, no more than that. Okay. So fact is that part. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. So in the next lecture, I will do the next problem in the notes also by hand, and that will actually involve the whole thing: developing the model, perfect model, transfer function, the block diagram, everything. Okay.